Now, Alexandria then is a great uh, Greek city with a large Jewish population. And the Jews of Alexandria, by the year 250 BC, had already acculturated to a large extent. That is, they were not Greek speaking. They were not Hebrew speaking. And that's why they needed a translation of the Bible. And so the Bible was translated into Greek. The first time the Bible was translated into a language other than Hebrew. The Septuagint translation, translation of the Bible, and scholars usually refer to it as Roman numeral 70. Okay. It's a Septuagint translation. It's in Greek, and it has certain features which indicate the prejudice of the translators, because every time you translate something, you betray it somehow. So there are certain things in it which betray, the, which show what the translators were trying to do. And that's revealed also in a letter which was written about that time, a letter called the Letter of Aristeas, written about 200 BC, in which he describes how the Bible came to be translated. And this is the story he tells. It's interesting that this is the story he tells, and, uh, and with variations that appears in the Talmud. He says, the emperor... Ptolemy Philadelphus II. Now, when Alexander conquered his empire, I told you he tried to make a world empire, capital in Babylon, and now it's going to be a Hellenistic empire, with the whole world being dominated by Greek civilization. He was not being, you know, he was not being uh, compulsory about it. He just felt that if I establish Greek cities all over the empire, and he established 31 Greek cities, they would be centers for the for the dissemination of Greek civilization, and the people would become to begin to speak Greek and it would create a world which would take advantage and enjoy the benefits of Greek science and philosophy and culture and so on. Alexander the Great, by the way, was not just a conqueror, and he was very competent there, but he was also a, a young man with quite a philosophical concept and ideas, and he thought he was going to create, he thought he would create what he called homonoia, homonoiete, that is one humanity, all peoples, all nations bound together into one cultural entity. Nice ideas, he had idealistic ideas. But at the peak of this whole thing, and he was trying to really unite the world, um, fever, four days in pain, and died. He died at the peak of this whole thing, at the age of 33, after he had done all of this. Now, um, without the, going into the problems and the details, what do we do now? Uh, the generals divided the empire among themselves. So Seleucus took uh, control of Asia, and Ptolemy, one of the generals, took control of Egypt, and he had Israel as part of his empire. Ptolemy I, then, who called himself the savior, was the one who established the Ptolemaic Empire of Egypt, which was Egypt ruled by a Greek ruler. Seleucus established the Seleucid Empire of Western Asia, uh, an empire of Phoenicians and Babylonians and Assyrians and Armenians and Arabs and Persians, ruled by a Greek. Now you see the potential problem there of a foreigner ruling. But all of these men also created their centers they're Greek centers, the capital cities. So Ptolemy I was the one who organized the empire. Ptol By the way, Seleucus, interestingly enough, when he established his empire 10 years after the death of Alexander the Great, said, we're starting a new era, a new age, and this is the year one. So 311 BC is the year one of the Seleucid era. And by the way, that era was used for many centuries as the number of the year. Before that, we don't have that kind of universal era. But he established it, and of course, later on, it was changed by the Christians. Now, Ptolemy II, who called himself Philadelphus, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, man of brotherly love, was emperor of a very wealthy empire, because this, the growth of these cities was an economic boom. And he was very rich, and his empire was rich, and he, he exported the products of Egypt, which were uh, wheat and oil and uh, other products of the agricultural wealth of Egypt. And there was trade between Greece and uh, Egypt and uh, Syria. The Eastern Mediterranean was just crisscrossed with merchant vessels, and both of the empires became rich. But 
Ptolemy had an ambition. Ptolemy II had an ambition. His ambition was to create in Alexandria the greatest Greek city in the world. And he did it by supplying what is essential. He asked, he actually sent letters. Any Greek artist, philosopher, sculptor, painter, musician, come to Alexandria and everything will be given that you need. And what did he do? He gave money. Gave money. And give money, they come. Uh, and they did come in large numbers. And in Alexandria, he happened to build the greatest Greek cultural center. So by the year 250 BC, it was the center of Greek civilization and culture on a large and high scale. There were also, uh, so there were Greeks there, but there were also non-Greeks who were Greek speaking and who began to express their ideas in the Greek language. And this is what we call the Hellenistic culture. You know, Hellenic culture, Greek culture is Athens up to the time of Alexander the Great. After this, you have a lot of non-Greeks who are participating in Greek culture. And incidentally, two of the most influential Greek writers in the Greek language of the first century, two of the most influential happened to be Jews who wrote in the Greek language. And they were Philo of Alexandria and St. Paul. I mean, their writings in Greek, these were Jews, they <laughs> changed the thinking process of the world, of the Western world. But it's interesting because they were Hellenistic. They were not Greeks, they were Jews. But they wrote in Greek and they, they were fluent in Greek. So the story told by uh, the letter of Aristeas, he says, the king wanted to have uh, the largest library in the world. And Alexandria did build probably the largest library in the Greek world. They say that at its peak it may have had 500,000 books, manuscripts, because oh, every book was a manuscript. And he says, and in the library he had a section of laws. And he decided he wants the laws of all the nations in the library. So he asked the Jews for a copy of their laws. So they said, the laws are in the Torah. The Torah is in Hebrew. But we'll ask the high priest of Jerusalem to authorize a translation. And so the Bible was translated by these 70 scholars. And uh, I suppose the Jews gave him a very fancy copy, bound in leather and gold and all that. And he, the king, accepted it and put it in his library. That's the story told by Aristeas. The true story is probably that, yes, they might have done that, but the effect is the Jews of Alexandria needed the Bible in Greek because this was their language. So that is the uh, extent to which Jewish life had expanded, and now it was growing in the Western world, in the Greek world.